All right, cool deal. So tonight we're going to go over uh, allergy and anaphylaxis. This is a pretty short chapter. Um, it's not going to be here all night long, so we're not going to keep it off any longer than we have to. Um, let's get this to work. All right, so again, same slide. We always have to read. I'm going to let you guys read that. It just, I hate these, you know, initial slides. All right, so immunology, immunology uh, is a recognition and management of shock and difficulty breathing related to anaphylactic reactions. Um, some of the anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology assessments and management of hypertension disorders or emergencies, hypersensitivity, I'm sorry, and anaphylactic reactions. We've all seen some people throughout time uh, potentially have anaphylaxis or a reaction to medication. Um, so when... So there's a difference in them, you know, like a reaction or a side effect. So like if the medicine, you don't like taking it because it makes you really sleepy, well, that's potentially a side effect. Um, like if you get on certain um, antibiotics and they tell you stay out of the sun because you'll burn really easy, well, that's a side effect, not a reaction. Um, a reaction's like uh, you get blotchy skin, uh, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath. Um, all those things are, are reactions. Um, so... Make sure that you try to differentiate the difference between the reaction and side effects, because sometimes people will try to lead you down that lane that it's a side effect when it's just or it's a reaction versus a side effect. I'm trying to answer my wife. I got an issue at the house. Get all this situated. I apologize, y'all. All right, so um, as an EMT, you're going to often respond to calls involving allergic reaction, and most likely it's going to be more than what you're probably used to. Uh, shortness of breath, slip trips and falls, and allergic reactions are going to be. You'll notice certain times of the year are going to be more prevalent than the others. Um, starting in the spring, you'll start to have the flowers, the bugs, the bees, all that fun stuff, and you'll start having more reactions at that point. So some of allergy-related emergencies involve acute airway obstruction, cardiovascular collapse. Um, you'll start to have the trouble breathing. My, my throat feels like it's closing you know, up. Uh, there's several different things that potentially will lead into that, but um, those are the time the calls that you're going to probably get majority of the time. Um, so you must be able to treat life-threatening conditions. That's our primary want to be here so we can learn how to improve these things, learn how to move forward. Um, you must also be able to distinguish between the body's uh, unusual response and the alert to an allergen and an uh, allergic, whew, an allergic reaction. So we're going to talk about an allergen and an allergic reaction. Let me get that right. So this chapter describes immunology, which is the study of the human body or the study of the body's immune system um, and the five categories that stimulate or the categories of stimuli, shall I say that, that may provoke an allergic reaction. Um, talking about anatomy and physiology, so the immune system does protect the body from foreign substances or organisms. That is our reaction. Like um, if we're out in the pasture, let's say the you know we all live in the south, majority of us, and you know start to have pollen, all the yellow clouds. That's something that we sneezing, our nose hairs, all those are filters to try to keep that out of our body. So with the foreign substance invades, once it does start invade, the body initiates a series of responses to, and, and that activates for an invader. So the pathophysiology. So an allergic reaction is, is an exergated immune response to a substance. So not, it's not caused directly by the outside stimulant or sting or bite, but it's gonna, it's gonna push that forward to where it's time to say, okay, something's going on, we need to react to it. So the chemicals include uh, histamines, uh, leukotrienes, which are both contribute to your allergic reaction. Most of the time, the body will automatically push those uh, histamines out. And that's what helps us to try to get on the front end of this allergic reaction and or uh, allergy because we, we're not used to it. So our body's reacting under natural instincts to fight that off. I knew it was coming. Um, some patients not know what is causing their allergic reaction. So you must be able to recognize the signs and symptoms and maintain a high index of suspicion 
So we can just try to ask these questions, what's going on, the who, what, when, where, and why of an, an, uh, an assessment. An um, allergic reaction may be a mild, could be local, could be characterized by itching, redness, or tenderness. We've all had this at some point in time, depending upon what's going on, you know, where we're at, what we're allergic to. Um, and then you can go into the severe systemic and a condition known as anaphylaxis. That is the worst end of this because we don't want to get into anaphylaxis because at soon after that, our respiratory system is going to shut down and our drive is going to go away. Here's a little chart that talks about anaphylaxis and this, this extreme life-threatening allergic reaction. Um, this involves multiple organisms. So let's talk about multiple organs, Ooh, organisms. So let's say we get stung, we get the bee. So the antihistamines are released from our body. Then it's gonna travel over here. It says release chemical mediators. So our body's automatically trying to fight this allergic reaction and push it off. So then we're gonna go over here to specific antibodies. So the body is gonna automatically release these that we have built alone. So boom, now we're starting to have issues. Then our lungs are gonna be bothered, our heart. We're going to have the decreased output because our uh, coronary flow is restricted. Our blood vessels are going, to, are, get, are going to dilate, which means they're going to get bigger because we need that blood flow and that antihistamine. So now our skin's going to get involved. So those four different organ systems are involved. So we're going to have edema, swelling of the skin. All of these different things are going to potentially take place on just one sting. Now we've all seen like the beekeepers and all that other stuff to where they get stung multiple times, but that's not their first rodeo. That's not the first time they go out there and they're a lot more calmer and cooler to collect than we would be if we got out there and started messing with those bees. Cause I can tell you, I'm not doing it. It's not gonna mess with them. It's not in, it's not in my job to do that. So we see this right here. This is a common sign, which was our hives. Uh, they get a little itchy, they get a little blotchy, sometimes they hurt when you get there. Then we're going to get into a more severe sign. So when you look at this next picture, you're automatically, everybody's going to think, oh my God, how's this woman alive? But you got to understand what potentially happened to her. So now you see this young lady. So her tongue is, it's massively swole and you can see her lips are starting to crack because they've got blisters. So something massive has happened, happened, happened either she's uh, had an allergic reaction to a food, been bitten or stung right there around the mouth. The majority of the, the tongue is there. She may have eaten something that's caused that issue. Uh, we have the angioedema, um, which is areas of localized swelling. Well, we know she's got it because that looks painful. Um, and then we talk about wheezing. So that's the high pitched whistle sound when they breathe. It's gonna be so what it is, is everything's closing off and it's making like a whistle sound that is having those issues when we start to, when we start to breathe because the antihistamines aren't enough. We need, we need some other help. We need some other medications that can help us fight this off. So Strider may be heard in inspiration if there's a super airway narrowing. So if it starts to get more and more narrow, uh, you're going to hear Strider. Again, I highly recommend you guys to go YouTube these different respiratory sounds so you can have an, an assumption of what they sound like. Now, granted, I can tell you if I walked up and, and heard somebody, I'd be like, is it Strider or is it wheezing? Because they both kind of sound the same. It's going to take me a minute. I haven't listened to a lot of people breathe in a long time. So hypotension is due to vasodilation, which is also increased in uh, capillary permeability. So hypotension means we're gonna get high, we're gonna get low blood pressure. You see, I got confused. So blood pressure is gonna drop due to the vasodilation because it's, so your blood vessels are going from here to here. So now more blood's flowing. So yes, our heart rates, I mean, our blood pressure is going to drop. Is that a good thing? No, we, we none of us want to be hypotensive, but that's what happens when everything starts to open. So patients may experience nausea, vomiting, and abdominal cramps. That may be a sign that's coming up. It, it, it's one of those, not everybody's going to have everything that we say as we go through these different chapters and different uh, uh, symptoms. The potential, uh, just to let everybody know that it's a, not necessarily a side effect, but you may see it or you may not. I mean, it's not, a, it's not set in stone that every patient's going to have the abdominal cramps. So some common allergies. So the most common allergen 
uh, falls into one of the following five categories. So you're allergic to food, certain foods, as in shellfish, peanuts, they may be the most common trigger to anaphylaxis. We have to be careful about that. There's a several people out here that is, uh, they, they have trouble with uh, seafood. Well, on Saturday night in the Gulf of Mexico, 99% of the platforms have seafood. So some of the people let us know in advance and they may cook their food separate and they may not come in the galley and eat. It's just one of those weird things that we have to accommodate for. So it's not going to be a rapid too. So if somebody eats this or smells it or touch it, this potentially can happen over a 30 minute period. So not just thinking that oh, it's going to be instant as soon as they touch it. No, no. So this may uh, may not include uh, skin size, as in hives. May not. You may see some redness right on the throat if they eat it or swallow it. So the reaction can be severe and involve the respiratory and or cardiovascular system. So initially, we're going to see the the vital signs increase because of the nervousness. And then once you start to get that basal dilation things going to start coming back down. Uh, we talk about medications. So medications are the second most common source of an anaphylactic reaction, particularly antibiotics, i.e. penicillin, um, is a non-steroided anti-inflammatory drug such as NSAID. So you see where the NSAIDs come from, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. There you go. You've probably heard NSAIDs part before. So this is another issue that's pretty severe. Uh, most likely these itch pretty bad. Um, this is caused by a medication uh, allergen. So if the medication is injected, the reaction may be uh, immediate or up to 30 minutes. That's the reason why when you go to the doctor's office and they make you sit for like 15 or 20 minutes, this, this is why that because it's an injection, we wanna make sure that you don't have that. So reactions to oral medications may take more than, Jesus may take longer than 30 minutes because it has to process through the body, down and ingest uh, small intestines and large intestines, so it can break down and be absorbed in the body. So just because you take a medication, don't expect it to be an instant cause. It could be up to 30 minute period. Um, plants, as we know, dust, everybody's at some point of allergic to a dust. We all sneeze from it, pollens. You live in the South, you can't hide from that. Um, so you can have other plant materials also cause a rapid or severe allergic reaction. Some common plant allergies include, include ragweed, ryegrass, maple, and oak. Those are your biggest four that are most common when you start talking about the outdoors, what triggers certain things. And I know somebody that is, can anybody else hear me or am I the only one that's I have an issue with? Rodney, can you hear me? All right. Alicia might be here, love. I don't know. Got to say, uh, I'm sorry, Sydney. I apologize, Nikisha. I, I am my bad. So, Sydney. You may try something small, hit the unmute button, turn the volume up, try it that way. I, I don't know. Um, so certain chemicals uh, such as makeup, soap, hair dye, latex. See, I have a latex allergy, and that's been because of years and years of me using uh, medical gloves that are latex. They were mainly latex back when I started. Now it's more the alternate, whatever they call them now, the nitrile gloves. That's what we use here. Um, so think about makeup too. A lot of your makeups have the uh, like the animal fat. Um, a lot of the makeup does have some horse additives. I don't know if it's, a, I don't know, but I know a lot of it comes from animals uh, when you talk about makeup. Um, we do know that latex is a big part a particular issue because a lot of people do have anaphylactic issues about that because it attacks the respiratory uh, faster than it does of the, uh, the face and the skin. Um, if you know that you have a patient, well, we try to make sure first, let's do this, back this up. Make sure that you don't have any latex on your ambulance. Uh, that is, there's so many more common people out there that do have the uh, latex allergen. 
So it is, it's kind of the common standard now to not even have any latex at all on your, uh, on your ambulance. We don't have any latex out here. Um, it's safer than sorry, which I'm fine with it. I have no issues that we just don't have it. Um, it it's, a, it's a big helper not to have it out here with us. Um, we all know we've had issues with insect bites. We get the mosquito bites, you get the bee stings. All those things happen to the body and we get triggers. We get side effects, we get issues. Um, we start to have swelling. Um, so here's a, here's a good point. So approximately 2 million Americans are allergic to venom of bees, wasps, and hornets, and allergic reactions to insect stings account for at least 62 deaths in the United States per year. That's a lot of people that pass away due to insects. And about half of these deaths, the victims had never experienced a reaction to prior. Um, my wife and I, when we first got together, we were out looking for an apartment. Um, her, she had never, ever had any issues with wasps or anything like that. She got stung by the big red wasps. Remember, we, some of us call them guinea wasps, um, and they lit her up, and she had a massive reaction to it. Uh, ended up taking her to the hospital. She had an EpiPen for a long time, but it was just like she's never had that before, and I don't know if it's because all of us had our, vent, uh, our heart rate up and going that it affected us because we were trying to run from them. Or she just had that massive allergic reaction that we that none of us were prepared for. Um, the sting organ is most uh, the stinging organ of most insects is a small hollow spine protecting. Okay, so let's look at this picture. So honeybees can't withdraw their stinger. Their stinger is always out. Um, if the stinger is not removed, it can continue to inject venom for up to twenty minutes. That's why we tell you to use like a credit card to identify it, then pull it out with the tweezers. Um, don't just rub your hand on there because you potentially can get it too. And all these stings that happens is once they sting, like this bee is detected to their abdomen, once they sting, they're, they're done. Um, so it's a, it's a life causing issue there. Uh, on picture B, wasp and hornets sting multiple times. We know that one wasp can, can sting you multiple times just because it's the only one around. Most of the time it's a sting and fly, but if you're infecting their area, their wash, their nest, their hornet, whatever, they're going to end up having more issues and they're gonna sting you multiple times. That's their sign of saying, go away. We don't need you here. We don't want you. We've all had the ant bites. Oh, God, we hate these things. They do cause the little, as you see down on the bottom, they cause the little red pus, pus pockets. Um, they hurt, they don't wanna be touched, but that's their way of telling you to, Leave us alone. Um, we know that certain ants uh, can strike repeatedly. Uh, we've seen this happen before. Um, ants, a lot of times, too, or uh, if you affect their area, because they leave little droplets of pheromones or something as they pass, and that's how they, they that's how they keep their lines. If you've ever noticed, if you see line, ants traveling in a line, just rub your finger across it or take your foot and draw across it. And they stop, they'll, they'll stop because where you rubbed your foot, that pheromone or that dirt trial or smell is not there. And they start wandering off and all that. And they may never get back, but that's how they trace things down is when they walk, they leave a path of pheromones or something like that. We all seen this one, y'all can imagine. They say this is a wheel, a well is a waddleless firm alvaluous. This is a little like mosquito bite to me, y'all. Y'all know what they are. Mosquito bites hurt. They suck. They itch. Um, it can whelp. It can cause, uh, you can see them over time. I've always tried my best never to, to scratch. I call it itch them, but never to scratch them because all it's going to do is it's going to intensify the, the effect um, that we're all having in a side effect of this medicine because they've done what they do. When they bite you, they inject whatever they inject you right there and they draw the blood out. But once they're done is that stays in you and that's what you're re re having a reaction to is the medicine or the, the chemical that they inject to you as they latch on. Oh, let's go back and look at that. So some of the signs and symptoms, um, those are very common is what you're gonna see um, in a lot of this uh, anaphylaxis or, or allergic reaction is the pain, the sudden, the swelling, the localized heat. Um, You'll have the redness, you'll see that right there. You'll have the way raised uh, whelp um, and, the, and the itching part. Those we know we've all, every one of us, I guarantee you in this class, the, the whole 10 of you have had at least one mosquito bite. 
and as aggravating as they are, it's just over time they stop. Once that chemical goes away, we, it stops. So in some severe cases of anaphylaxis, you can have strider, bronchiospasms, and wheezing. That's where your respiratory tract is having a spasm, and it's sitting here doing this. It's, it's, it's shaking back and forth, trying to figure out it, it's reacting to that venom that's in there. You have the chest tightness and coughing because oh, I can't kiss my breath. It, it hurts to breathe. It's, just, <coughs> it's restricting my airway. Those are the things you're going to see. You potentially can see the dyspnea, the one or two word dyspnea. We told you about where they're token like this because they, they can't get enough air. Obviously, the anxiety is going to be high because we know how bad it is to get, to get stung, bitten, uh, or even um, latched on by a mosquito. Those all in place have their own issues. Uh, gastrointestinal complaints, I don't, I have never come across those just because uh, maybe it depends on the particular insect that's gotten a hold of them. And then hypotension, we know why they're gonna be in hypotensive because they're gonna vasodilate because it's gonna make it bigger and there's gonna be more blood flow. So obviously the vital signs is gonna drop. Now we wanna be able to fix this the fastest that we can. So we're not suffering from it on the back end uh, because if we let it go too long, they're going to crash because of an ant bite. Patients may commonly, uh, occasionally experience a respiratory failure. If it's untreated, an anaphylactic reaction can proceed rapidly to death. So if we don't do something, they're going to die. Um, that may be ALS intervention that you meet some made up with a paramedic. That may mean rapid transport to a local facility. Um, we as, or you as an EMT basis don't have any medication that you can provide to them but if they have their EpiPen or their own inhaler, we can do an assisted delivery. Remember, we take their hand, our hand, and we help them uh, deliver that medication into their body. Patient assessments in, in an immune, immunologic emergency. Well, obviously our seam size up. Well, is it okay for me to go in there? Is there still a swarm of bugs around them? If so, I, I ain't going. I mean, I'm sorry that they're down and having issues, but not going. I need it to be safe for me. Obviously, food allergy, we know most of the time it's probably going to be a safe scene if they're having a food allergy. Um, new medication regimen. Um, a lot of those questions may be like, okay, so what is, did you take something new? Did you eat something new? Potentially can cause it. Well, I started this new medicine. Well, what is it? Um, and it, I don't know every medicine in the world. I know a lot of them, but I, I still Google. I Googled one today that arrived for a guy out here on the shore, out there on the deck. I didn't know what it was. I Googled it to see what kind of medication it was. So if he could take it or not, look at the medications. Um, does it potentially have a side effect of what you're seeing? Or, you know, you can put medications that react to, but, and you can Google and tell you what some of those answers are. Um, scene safety, always be mindful of other potential causes of respiratory distress. Um, could it be due to a chemical exposure? Well, if so, hey, you, you come to me. Um, traumatic event, uh, traumatic injury may also be present. We, we don't know what potentially happened. We're getting there to fill out what's going on. What is, what is the reason you called me? Um, follow standard precautions with a minimum of gloves and eye protection, which we know that. We talked about doing ALS interventions. Um, if we need them, let's get them there and always, excuse me, we can always meet them further down the road or they can come to us closer. Those are some of the things that we need to, to pre-plan in our head. Like how, how bad do we think they're going to be? You know, you can be like dispatch, go ahead and roll me an ALS unit, um, be advised we'll meet them in route or meet me at the mile marker 54 exit. That may be a good point to where you're off the road and not working on a highway area. Um, certain gas stations may be big for your area and you can have an intervention there uh, with the paramedic, not trying to get you to go through an intervention. Um, if we're able to on our primary assessment, we need to quickly identify uh, the threat and immediate potential for life-threatening issues. We need to assess the ABCs. 
We need to form a general impression. What do we think about you? What's going on with this patient? Um, allergic reactions may be present as respiratory conditions or cardiovascular distress in forms of shock. If the patient is anxious and is in distress, immediately call for ALS backup. Um, look for medical information tag. There's some medicine that I'm allergic to, but I ain't wearing that. I'm just not doing it. If it's my time, it's my time. I've thought about having it tattooed on me. I've seen it before. I've seen tattoo bracelets of, let's say, I'm allergic to seafood and it's tattooed on their arm. And most of the time we would see that when I flip their arm over to start an IV on them. Um, it's things like that you'll see. Um, but look for those ID tags around the neck, the wrist. Um, not many people wear them around the ankles, but those are your two main points to look for medical identification. Um, airway you're breathing, uh, anaphylaxis can cause rapid swelling of the upper airway, so it's good to start, start blocking it off. You're gonna lose the vocal parts because it's starting to swell so much. Not all allergic reactions are anaphylactic. Just because you're having an allergic reaction doesn't mean we're gonna get to the anaphylactic. That's just a reaction that's gonna happen. Um, you may not have known that you're allergic to that particular medicine, but you unfortunately found out that way. Um, airway and breathing, always quickly, quickly assess those six bullet points. Um, what is their workload of breathing? Does it look like it's rapid? Is it delayed? What's going on? Uh, use of accessory muscles. So our accessory muscles are our stomach muscles. Um, if the stomach's coming in, the chest is going out. Chest is going in, the stomach's going out. We're using those muscles to assist us in breathing better. Um, head bobbling. Because what we're trying to do is we're, we're making our body move the way that our, our lungs are. So if our lungs are inhaling, we're trying to lean back and give it as much space as we can so it can get as much oxygen. Nasal flaring, if they're sucking their nostrils in because they're breathing such at a high rate. And the abdominal breath sounds. Listen to their stomach. Maybe their lungs have, uh, they've had trouble with their lung. Maybe one's been punctured. Um, listen to see if you hear breath sounds. Um, those are ideal and super important to find out what, what's going on. Remember, always give them oxygen in there. Oxygen is oxygen. It's the first day we want to give to somebody that's in respiratory distress, no matter the situation. Never withhold that, uh, that medicine from them. Assist the patient to a comfortable position. It don't matter what position they're in. Just get them comfortable. We can take care of them. If they do happen to have signs of shock, place them in the supine position. That means flat on my back. The Trendelenburg position is where I elevate their feet to a 45 degree angle. So the head, the body's supine. If I elevate their feet, that is a Trendelenburg position. For a patient in severe respiratory distress, you may have to assist in ventilations using a bag valve mask attached to a high flow of oxygen. And what we want to do is we want to time their inhalations with the time that we squeeze the bag. Let off as they're exhaling and always uh, ventilate with their respiratory uh, tract. But make sure you hook it up to high flow O2 because if you don't hook it up to it, it's not going to help them. You need that extra bump of high flow oxygen to get them going. So that's just going to be helpful if you just go boop, plug it up to the O2 tank, turn it on. And when they breathe, you're breathing. You're helping, you're bagging them to create a, a, a better flow of oxygen because there's a respiratory issue. There's, there's something that's squeezing it, something that's tightening. We need to fix that. Regulation. Uh, some patients uh, and anaphylaxis may present with signs and symptoms of circulatory distress. Um, most of the time, you're going to get that... Uh, Sorry, just listen to what they're saying. So let me see. So anaphylaxis, majority of the time you're gonna see that in a respiratory issue. Um, you can get the cardio act, you can get the cardio -like, cardiological emergency while you're dealing with that, that shortness of breath, the 
trouble breathing, those things can come up and play. Um, again, we talked about the hypo the hypoperfusion is hypo means low, so they're not perfusing good enough, so their vital signs are going to be low. That's what hypo is. We know it's low. Treat for shock. Now, the definitive treatment for anaphylactic shock is epinephrine, but you guys don't carry it. If you're on a basic truck, you're not going to carry epi. You're not going to carry an epi pen. So what we like to say on the streets is a massive bolus of diesel or gas and a one-way trip to the hospital with lights and sirens. That's what we need to do. I've told many of my partners, hey, give me that bolus of diesel. And they know we go with lights and sirens to the hospital. It's because we need to be there. We need to hurry up and get this patient to the highest level of care, even though I have epi, I have an ET tube, I have a laryngoscope that I can use on them to put a tube down their throat. But again, if they're starting to swell, I may not have the best opportunity for that. And our primary assessment, we need to know, is this a load and go or is this a stay in play? Um, even if it's a load and go and you've already called for the a paramedic to arrive, go ahead and get that patient in the back of the ambulance. And once they get there, they go, and they get out and get in your truck. They're not having to get in the house and load the patient. Go ahead and move that patient to the truck to when they get there, they got all their toys in the cabinets and they can treat this patient faster. And if the patients do not exhibit symptoms, consider continuing the assessment, err on the side of emergency and transport. So if we need to hurry up and go, just tell them, be like, hey, listen, we're gonna go a hurry up. We're not gonna go lights and sirens, but at the same time, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and get you to the ambulance so we can get you to the hospital because I, I just wanna make sure that you're taken care of and the best way I can is get you to the hospital as fast as I can. Now, no, we're not gonna turn the lights and sirens on. We're not gonna do all that fun stuff, but I just wanted you to know that we are potentially gonna be going kind of fast because I want you to be taken care of. I'm not lying to them. I just may not be telling them we're going lights and sirens. When I ask them about their history, what do I want to know? Have they, what is the patient's chief complaint? And have you had this before? Have you had any signs, any symptoms or calls or issues with this before? Another good thing is to ask some people when they've had allergic reactions or have you been intubated before? It means intubation is when I put the tube down their throat and I breathe for them. Have you ever been intubated? Well, yes, sir, only three times. That's a three too many in my book. Um, I, I don't want to be intubated. So just saying that's, and ask that history. Ugh. So associated signs and symptoms. Do we see the, um, accelerated heart rate? Do we see potential hypotension? Do we see anxiety? Those things are potentially uh, triggers saying, okay, well, they're having respiratory difficulty because you can visually see what's going on. Here's your little chart to kind of think about. It. Do we see those, those blotchy skins? Do we see the hive? Do we see the welts? Um, what do we visually see that can tell us they're potentially having an allergic reaction? Um, there's some new additional signs and symptoms of allergic reaction. I'm going to let y'all read that for a little bit more. Right. So we talk about our sample, which we've gone over sample, sample multiple times. So if a patient is responsive, obtain a sample history. Rich remembers signs, uh, allergies, medications, past pertinent histories, uh, events leading up to this and anything extra. Um, so it's last oral intake and events leading up to this. My bad. And then we include our OPQRST. Uh, remember, those are important because it's onset, provocation, quality, uh, respiratory signs and symptoms, and what treatment we do. Um, ask him or her the following questions specific to allergic reaction. 
have any interventions already been done? Have they taken an inhaler prior to our arrival? Have they done anything to help fix this prior to my arrival? Has the patient's experienced a se severe allergic reaction in the past? And that's what I was saying is we want to make sure um, that that is scheduled. Uh, sorry, that I'm trying to read a message that this allergic reaction, if it's never happened before, okay, we, we let's, that's better. But if they have had it happen before, what was the outcome? What did you do? Was it one of those, oh, I had to be transported because I was put on a, a, a ventilator? Oh, well, let's go to the hospital right now. So that's another thing that we can look forward to. Um, history alert says, be alert for any statement regarding the ingestion of foods that commonly cause allergic reactions. Food, uh, we talk about peanuts, um, several different allergies, but peanuts are the biggest ones. Inquire about the presence of a gastrointestinal complaint such as nausea and vomiting. Tell them, hey, at any point in time during this trip, if you start to become nauseous, please let me know. I don't, I don't want you to throw up in the back of my truck. That is not something that I want to clean up later on. So if you tell me that you're nauseous, I'm going to fix that. Because if you throw up, I'm going to throw up there with you. I have a weak stomach. So on our physical exam, if it's indicated, perform a rapid exam of the body from head to toe, conduct a physical examination, uh, and uh, examination of the focused areas are the chief complaint. Uh, if you happen to have issues with it, they're having trouble breathing, um, remove the clothing as necessary and look for the presence of a bee sting, uh, signs of contact with chemicals, and other clues suggesting of a reaction. All those have issues uh, we want to look for. Uh, I, Oscillate for abdomen, uh, abnormal breath sounds, such as wheezing or strider, and carefully inspect the skin for swelling, rashes, or eucardia. So always listen to the patient when they're breathing. Um, if they're having trouble uh, breathing and we're listening to them, we can hear it right there. We know what's going on. Uh, listen for those breath sounds. We listen to the upper lobes, lower lobes, and we do it on the back. We want to know if it's more right-sided or left-sided, because remember, there's three lobes over here. I need to make sure that I hear them all. Um, am I potentially hearing upper respiratory wheezing or lower respiratory wheezing is important because we, we need to treat that and pass that information on to the physician, to the nurse, whatever we need to do to the uh, hospital. Um, physical exam, vital signs. We preach this over and over and over. Those are very important for us to get is the vital signs. Once we get vital signs, that's our baseline of what's going on. There's our baseline of pulse respiratory rate, blood pressure, uh, pupillary response, oxygen saturation. Those are important. I need to know what my baseline is. So when we move forward, if there's been any progress or we're kind of going backwards because we're not helping them. Um, signs, uh, skin signs may be uh, unreliable indicators of hyper perfusion um, as they may be widely varied or hidden a swell and a ration. So we're not really going to look for the, the change of color with the patient or their skin starts changing skin cup color and condition. Well, if they're warm to touch, it could be because of the reaction. Uh, but the conditions, it can fool you because the hives may be there and now you're not able to particularly uh, assess that stomach, uh, assess that patient. Sorry if you can't tell guys, I'm very uncomfortable in this chair for some odd reason tonight. Um, on our monitoring devices, our pulse ox is our number one tool when we go to assess the respiratory tract. So use that tool. Um, when we go to apply oxygen, let's be smart about this. Or they feel like they're having trouble breathing. So if we put them on a non-rebreather and we cover their face, is that going to affect them and start to have them think, I can't breathe any harder? So do we put them on a non rebreather I mean, a, or a nasal cannula? Well, that's kind of the patient dependent. Um, what is, and we base it off of what leaders we want to give because it's based off of what their workload is. If they're struggling to breathe, I'm obviously going to put them on 15 liters and a non rebreather and just tell them that's the best we can do. We talk about ab abnormal lung sounds. Does it not 
Does this sound good? Does it sound like crap? Listen to what that patient is. Um, listen to a lot of breath sounds initially on the beginning. If, once you get a pair of stethoscopes, uh, a set of stethoscopes, listen to people on a normal basis. Listen to what's going on. Um, have them just breathe normal for you. Um, I don't know who that is. Um, but so you can hear what a normal breath sound is on a normal instance. Other than that, you need to figure out, like when you start listening to sick people, you'd be like, oh, these, this doesn't sound normal. Like something's, something's wrong. Like what's, what's the deal? Are we doing something that's not, that's normal? Are they having any trouble breathing? Is their airway starting to occlude? All those things. Uh, so I encourage you to start listening to breath sounds and it helps you build your assessment as you move forward with every little patient. Um, do an assessment on somebody that lives in your home. That way you can get a normal, well, what is a normal baseline of somebody of the same age? Well, we may know. Well, this person may be 42 years old and the best health of their state in their life and have, you know, a 12 pack abdomen. Well, I mean, I ain't got that. So our vital signs are probably gonna be a little different, but I know what normal respiratory rate sounds like, rate, rhythm, quality. I know that because I've listened to it before. Um, I have an instance like when I get on the ambulance and I do work, I, I do listen to more breath sounds than I normally would even out here just because it's, it's letting me, it's training myself as we go. Maybe you don't want to sleep. Um, so as we're going down the road, we want to repeat our primary assessment. We're going to continue this um, every, well, for a critical, we're going to do it every five minutes. For a non-critical, we're going to do it every 10 to 15 minutes, whatever basis off of your company policies. In the book, it's showing every 15 minutes. Um, I've always, our monitors are set for every 10 minutes where I work at, and these over here are. So every 10 minutes, I, I'm going to be doing an assessment while en route to the hospital or en route to a meet uh, a paramedic on beat me on board. Sorry. So those things being in place, keep that assessment going. Make sure that my interventions are working. Speaking of interventions, look at this one. Have I done anything to them that has improved them or gotten them worse? Well, I need to know. So do an assess your ongoing assessment is going to help with that. So we're going to determine the severity of the reaction. Uh, mild reactions may require only supportive care and monitoring, which means we're just going to watch them. If they need something while they're out, I'm going to give it to them because I'm right there. Anaphylaxis does require more aggressive treatments, um, including EpiPens and inventory support. Now, not just EpiPens, but I can give it to them in an IV form. Um, but they may require us to breathe for them where we use the back valve mask on them because that the BVM, I mean, uh, the non-rebreather mask is just not enough. So we need to, we need to breathe for them on the back valve mask. Um, I told you always choose the most appropriate facility when you're getting ready to transport these patients, figure out what the best is. If it's saying, okay, well, this Band-Aid station doesn't have a respiratory tech there. I need to go to the next one, which is 10 more minutes down the road. Well, it's the better one in any way for that patient. And I, I can, I can make it because this patient is stable enough that we can make that there. Um, even if the patient is experiencing relief, transport the emergency department is still warranted because the medications eventually will wear off and they're gonna be in the same boat. Remember, if you didn't write it down in your report, it didn't happen. Documentation. Um, Signs and symptoms, reasons what you recalled there for, reasons what you did, uh, why you did it, uh, signs, symptoms, treatments, value, uh, vital signs, everything needs to go into this report, but it needs to flow. Some agencies use uh, certain like EPCR for reports. Uh, they use healthcare. They use all these different reporting systems that way that when you send it to a facility or it transfers over into the, uh, the hospital system, uh, even in your system for your company, it, it's all filed the same way. So no matter what you work on, you're going to always have a basically a computer-based report 
and one's going to always be sent to the hospital. One's going to be stored on file. Uh, and then once you're done with it, it closes off of that particular PC that you may be using or tablet in your ambulance. And you don't have to worry about them anymore. It's stored on the cloud. Wherever the cloud may be, it's stored there. Um, if the patient appears to be having a severe allergic reaction, we know we're just going to give them basic, basic life support and transport them to the hospital. It doesn't have to be done as in lights and sirens every single time we get to them. Maybe they are having, you know, at a personal emergency, but they just need help. Let's get them to where they need to go. Here, as you see, they're trying to remove the stinger from a person's arm. They are using the edge of the credit card to swipe it down. They don't want you to use tweezers because you can potentially push it further down. And once it gets underneath the skin, it creates like an infection site. They may have all sorts of other things. So you're gonna put that credit card at an angle and you're gonna drag it back. It does help pop that stinger out of the skin. Um, and that's kind of the most approved way for it to be done these days. Um, anytime that you have a sting, a bite, an animal bite or whatever else, you always wanna wash the area with a, a good antiseptic soap or you can use hand soap as in like, but you wanna create suds. You just don't wanna use this alcohol hand gels that we all have everywhere. We don't wanna use that. We wanna use soap and water. Um, anytime that you happen to remove, if I get bitten up here, I wanna remove all the jewelry. I wanna move my watch, my ring, even though my ring's rubber because you can potentially have a reaction that's gonna cause it to swell and then that jewelry is going to create more pain, so we don't want that. If you can, position the injury below the heart site because it's going to get to the heart faster. So we want it to, we want the body to have to work harder, so it gives us more time. So if I'm bitten on the arm, I want to make sure I hold my arm down by my side, not above my head like this, and like, oh, my arm hurts. We want to keep it lower than the heart. Um, apply ice or cold packs. When we go to apply these, we want to. We don't want to apply them directly to the skin and not any longer than 10 minutes. Um, most of the time we aren't told that. If we go to apply ice, we want to lay something over this and then put ice on top of it um, in a bag, uh, whatever, but you don't want to do ice to skin contact because it potentially can freeze the skin and cause a little bit of issues in the long run. So be careful about that. Um, Always be alert for any type of airway swelling. Uh, you may, that can be other signs of anaphylaxis. Uh, we talked about nausea, we have vomiting. Um, but do not give the patient by anything by mouth because we don't want to potentially cause a choking hazard by us giving them something. So be cautious of using uh, any oral medications that way. Place the patient supine, uh, always provide oxygen as needed. Uh, monitor the patient's vital signs. Again, we need to get a baseline so we know. We just don't know if we have to do it now. And be prepared to prevent, uh, provide further supportive, uh, supportive needs while en route. Um, and I say if they have an allergic reaction, they're going to get worse before they get better. Um, but that being said is, is make sure that what you provide is for the benefit of the patient, not that you're going to hurt them. Um, we've heard about epinephrine, but we was, it, this is what it does. So it does mimic the fight or flight response. Um, that's our body saying, okay, we're going to sit here and fight this or we're going to bug out. Well, it does mimic that and it dumps that load of epinephrine into the body. Um, it causes the blood vessels to constrict, which reverses the vasodilation and the hypotension. So instead of being all swollen like this, it's going to try to constrict it back to here or back to normal. And that's going to start slowing it down. We're going to turn around and start getting the heart rate kind of normal, back to some normal, uh, to normal rates and rhythms and uh, normal pre pressures. Um, other properties uh, of epinephrine increase the cardiac uh, chondri chondri contracticity and, and reverses the bronchiospasm. So you're going to see the heart rate increase. Um, you're going to see the vital signs probably increase too because you're probably going to go up on a blood pressure. Uh, respiratory rate's going to go up. Um, just several things are going to go up because that's being, it's that epinephrine's working on that particular person. Oh, well, it can, at the very bottom bullet, it can help reverse the effects of uh, anaphylaxis, but it's not going to just be like, poof, it's all gone. 
we're back to normal. It's going to help reverse it and try to make, and it's going to help make those the symptoms and all that less aggressive. Uh, it's not going to be as hard. We're going to make sure that you take a deep breath and everything's going to be, it's going to be a little bit easier, but it's not going to be instantly. Um, so epinephrine is prescribed by a physician uh, and it comes in a pre-dosed. If anybody's seen a pre-dosed and haven't, there's a picture of it on the next screen. Um, some EMS systems are authorized to carry this as a part of their regular onboard medications. And other EMS providers are only permitted to, to help provide assistance in giving this medication. Uh, bottom bullet's the best thing we can say. Refer to your local protocols or consult med, med control when you're talking about needing to help with uh, an EpiPen. Here's a picture of an EpiPen. This particular provider with purple gloves on is assisting, they're basically giving the medication, but I tell you to always at least try to hate, take the patient's hand. If they're in severe respiratory distress or there are no signs of being unconscious, just, just give it to them. That's the easiest way I can tell you. Um, EpiPens do deliver 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine. Does deliver 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine and children's doses it delivers 0.15 milligrams. The MG is milligrams, so uh, that is not even near a quarter uh, milligram or a one cc verse. So I would know that 0.3 is delivered by an adult EpiPen and 0.15 is delivered for infants and children. Uh, infant child system delivers at a 0.15. Hint, hint, hint. Did everybody get that written down? Give y'all time to at least somebody answers me in the chat that y'all got that written down. Rodney, you got that written down? I'll pick on you. Got it. All right, we got one person there. Um, some side effects of the uh, epinephrine, all of those are going to be side effects. Now, again, these aren't allergic reactions because the medication is going to make their blood pressure high. The anxiety is going to increase. Their cardiac arrhythmia is going to increase because their blood, because their heart rate's going through the roof now. Uh, they can get dizzy and potentially have chest pains because we just dump 0.3 milligrams of epi into their system. And their body's not used to it. That's like me giving somebody a Red Bull that's never had an energy drink before. They're going to have those same signs and symptoms right there because of what it does to the body. So that being the same case, those are pretty much a lot of the side effects we're going to see. And do not give epinephrine to any patient without the signs of respiratory compromise or hypotensive. If they have their EpiPen and they say, I'm having trouble breathing, give it to them. That's what it's there for. Uh, those who do not meet the criteria or for diagnosis of anaphylaxis may not be wanting to be giving it to. Now, if they start to have the rapid onset, they start to have the hives, maybe they ate something that got to them. Okay, let's give it. It's what it's there for. Uh, uh, I mean, baby, we got you. We, we're going to take care of it. Uh, so technically, they have side effects that mimic a myocardial fraction. So as you see right there, it, it's going to give you those. But in a heart, in a heart attack, we're going to have different issues because you're going to have the, the chest tightness. You're going to have the, uh, the sweat that's going to pull around. This chest pain will go away when the, um, ep after the epinephrine has circled through the body. Chest pains for uh, a myocardial infarction, it's gonna stick around. They're, they're gonna be there. They're gonna have that dullness. This is gonna be one of those sharp pains and it's just like, oh God. So yes, they do mimic them, but there is a difference of the pains. Um, once you put like have a paramedic or an EMT advance get on scene and they put them on the cardiac monitor, you'll be able to see a rhythm that shows that that it's not going to affect the uh, the cardio uh, cardio uh, incident that you're speaking of. 
So this will be more of a, be like, I got stung right here. Okay, well then I'm gonna pretty much say we're dealing with a allergic reaction or, you know, um, that requires our epinephrine. Uh, I told y'all tonight was short and sweet and beautiful because I know y'all missed me. Um, that is the end of class. Does anybody have any questions? Um, your test will open tonight. Please, please, please log in and take your test. I don't know how many times I need to say that, but please, please, please take your test. Um, it would be very, it behoove you guys to take your test as soon as possible. Any questions, concerns, or problems? Anything you want to talk to me about? But Bueller, Bueller, probably calling my age right there, my bad. All right, folks, there's your class code for tonight. Uh, any fire guys in here who know the best way to get a fantastic immune test? M's, National Institute System, or what am I, what am I losing there? in there too in the chat. Uh, what is the NIMS test? I'm going to Google that, Rodney. Uh, uh, I might be able to help you too. Um, but let me check. So NIMS, uh, the best thing you can, oh, hang on, let me turn this off so we're not recording all that.